Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Isinger. Uh, very grateful for the opportunity to be here. Ich freue mich hier in Deutschland sein. Nice to be with everybody. And I am. Uh, I want to remark that uh, Ambassador Isinger had the pleasure of going to the renowned Fletcher School uh, at Tufts University, but it sounds to me like he lost his Boston accent. I don't know what happened to him along the way. This is a very real special for pleasure for Chuck and me to be here uh, at this conference. We do know this conference well, um, and as uh, Walter said, we are not just friends from the Senate, but we're friends from a common experience of a long period of time. So uh, it's a pleasure for us now to be working together as partners uh, with respect to the national security issues that challenge all of us. Uh, so uh, the fact is also that both Chuck and I uh, feel this Atlantic relationship uh, very much in our bones. Uh, both of our families emigrated to the United States from Europe, and both of our fathers uh, signed up to fight tyranny and totalitarianism in World War II. And we both watched the Berlin Wall go up as we grew up, and we grew up as Cold War kids. So we come to these discussions, both of us, with part of our formative years planted in the post-Cold War, post-World War period, and certainly deeply in the Cold War period, as a kid who grew up in school doing drills to get under my desk in the event of nuclear war. Uh, this is something that still uh, conditions my thinking. Uh, it was during that period of time that I first encountered uh, what I came to understand is one of the unmistakable symbols of the enduring American-European partnership. Uh, I was a young kid who uh, served, uh, who was with my father uh, in Berlin when he served as the legal advisor to the then High Commissioner to Germany, James Conant. And I spent a piece of my childhood getting on trains in Frankfurt and going through the dead of night to arrive in Berlin be greeted by the American military band and move between a British sector, a French sector, an American sector, and a Russian sector. So I can remember uh, cold signs warning you about where you were leaving, and I can remember guns rapping on the windows of my train when I dared to lift the blinds and try to look out and see what was on the other side. I'll also never forget walking into a building. I used to ride my bicycle down the Kurfürstendamm when it was still rubble. We're talking about the early 1950s, just to date myself. And you could see a plaque on a building that said, this was rebuilt with help from the Marshall Plan. But the truth is, today as we gather in Munich in 2014, George Marshall's courageous vision Resisting the calls of isolationism and investing in this partnership requires all of us to think about more than just buildings. Uh, that period of time saw the Marshall Plan lead America's support for the rebuilding of a continent. But it was more than just the rebuilding of a continent. It was the rebuilding of an idea. It was the rebuilding of a vision that was built on a set of principles. And it built alliances that were just unthinkable only a few years before that. And I say all of this to try to put this meeting and the challenges that we face in a context. So long as I ha can remember, I have understood that the United States and Europe are strongest when we stand united together for peace and prosperity, when we strand in strong defense of our common security, and when we stand up for freedom and for common values. And everything I see in the world today tells me 
that this is a moment where it's going to take more than words to fulfill this commitment. All of us need to think harder and act more in order to meet this challenge. With no disrespect whatsoever, in fact, only with the purest of admiration to the strategic and extraordinary vision of Brent Scowcroft sitting over here, Henry Kissinger, it's Big Brzezinski, who I don't see, but I know is here somewhere. There he is. These are men who helped to shape and guide us through the Cold War and the tense moments and the real dangers that it presented. But the fact is that this generation of confluence of challenges that we're confronting together are in many ways more complex and more vexing than those of the last century. The largely bipolar world of the Cold War, East-West, was relatively straightforward compared to the forces that have been released with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the rise of sectarianism, the rise of religious extremism, and the failure of governance in many places. In fact, we should none of us be surprised that it is the wisdom and vision of Henry Kissinger in his brilliant book, Diplomacy, which if you've read it, reread it, if you haven't, read it for the first time, lays all of this out in his first chapter as he talks about the balance, uh, the old game of balance of power and interests. And as he predicts that this is more convoluted because of the absence of a structure to really manage and cope with this new order that we face. Those were his words. So today we are witnessing youth populations, huge youth populations, 65% of a country under the age of 30, under the age of 25 in some places, 50% under the age of 21, 40% under the age of 18, unemployed, disenfranchised, except for what globalization has brought them and their capacity to be able to reach out and see what the rest of the world is doing, even as they are denied the opportunity to do it too. An enormous, desperate yearning for education, for jobs, for opportunity. That's what drove Tahrir Square, not the Muslim Brotherhood, not any religious extremism, but young kids with dreams, that's what led that fruit vendor in Tunisia to self-immolate after he grew too tired of being slapped around by a police officer and denied his opportunity just to sell his fruit wares where he wanted to. We are facing threats of terrorism and untamed growth in radical sectarianism and religious extremism, which increases the challenge of failed and failing governments and the vacuums that they leave behind. And all of this is agitated by a voracious, globalized appetite and competition for resources and markets that do not always sufficiently share the benefits of wealth and improved quality of life with all citizens. And this is all before you get to the challenge of global food security, water availability, and global climate change. These are the great tests of our time. Now, even as our economies in the United States and Europe begin to emerge from the economic trials of the last years, we are not immune to extremism or to the natural difficulties of nurturing democracy, and particularly as we measure what is happening with the number of jihadists who are attracted by the magnet of the Assad regime to Syria, where from Europe and from America and from Australia and from Great Britain and from many other places they now flock to learn the trade of terror and then perhaps to return to their home shores. The task of building a, a Europe that is whole and free and at peace is not complete. Now, in order to meet today's challenges, both near and far, America needs a strong Europe, and Europe needs a committed and engaged America. 
And that means turning inward is not an option for any of us. When we lead together, others will join us. But when we don't, the simple fact is that few are prepared or willing to step up. That's just a fact. And leading, I say respectfully, does not mean meeting in Munich for good discussions. It means committing resources, even in a difficult time, to make certain that we are helping countries to fight back against the complex, vexing challenges of our day. I'll tell you, I was recently in Korea and reminded that 10 of the 15 countries that used to receive aid from the United States of America as recently as in the last 10 years are today donor countries. Think about that. 10 of the 15 and the others are on their way to being donor countries. Now let me be fair. We need to have this debate in America too right now. The small fraction of our budget that we invest in our diplomacy and in foreign assistance is a minuscule investment compared to the cost of the crises that we fail to avoid. So as a transatlantic community, we cannot retreat, and we must do more than just recover, all of us. What we need in 2014 is a transatlantic renaissance, a new burst of energy and commitment and investment in the three roots of our strength, our economic prosperity, our shared security, and the common values that sustain us. Now first, our shared prosperity. Who would have imagined at the first Munich conference in 1963 that $2.6 billion in goods and services would flow between us every day? That didn't happen by accident. Nor did the $4 trillion that we invest in each other's economies every single year, or the more than 13 million jobs that we support mutually because of it. The depth and breadth of our economic position, partnership, <clears throat> was a conscious choice of the men I described and other men and women during that period of time who had a vision. And they need to be a conscious reflection of our vision today. Today, as our economies recover, we also have to do more to put this indispensable partnership to work, a shared prosperity that benefits us all. And we can start, frankly, by harnessing the energy and the talents of our people, which is what the transatlantic trade and investment partnership is all about. TTIP is about more than growing our economies. It will promote trade, investment, innovation. It will bring our economies closer together while maintaining high standards in order to ensure that we create good jobs for these young people who are screaming about the future. And it will cement our way of doing business as the world's gold standard. Imagine what happens when you take the world's largest market and the world's largest single economy and you marry them together with the principles and the values that, that come with it. It will, it will, if we're ambitious enough, TTIP will do for our shared risk prosperity what NATO has done for our shared security, recognizing that our security has always been built on the notion of our shared prosperity. We are the most innovative economies in the world, the United States and Europe. And as such, we have a major responsibility to deal with this growing, uh, uh, growing potential catastrophe of climate change. I urge you, read the latest IPCC report. Uh, it's really chilling. And what's chilling is not rhetoric. It's the scientific facts. Scientific facts. And our history is filled with struggles through the Age of Reason and the Renaissance and the Enlightenment for all of us to earn some respect for science. The fact is that there is no doubt about the real day-to-day -day impact of the human contribution to the changing climate. Next year, the United States will assume responsibility for the Arctic Council 
And I can tell you, just looking at what's happening in the Arctic, and there are others here who are deeply invested in that, we have enormous challenges. None of them are unsolvable. That's the agony of this moment for all of us. There are answers to all of these things. But there seems to be an absence of will, an absence of collective leadership that's ready to come together and tell our people, not what they're necessarily telling us through this crazy social media, incredible confluence of information that they're sort of told they're interested in, but for us as leaders to suggest to them, this is what you ought to be interested in because it actually affects your life and your livelihood and your future. President Obama is implementing an ambitious plan that sees climate change not only as a challenge, but as an incredible set of opportunities for all of us, and I believe that. The marketplace that created the great wealth in our country in the 1990s, which saw every single quintile of our income earners see their income go up, every quintile, saw their income go up. And we created the greatest wealth the world has seen during the 1990s, greater even in America than the period of the Pierponts, the Morgans, the Rockefellers, Carnegie's, Mellon's, much greater. You know what it was? It was a $1 trillion market with 1 billion users. It was the high-tech market, personal computer, mostly communications. The energy market that we are staring at that is the solution to climate change. Energy policy is the solution to climate change. That market, my friends, is a $6 trillion market today with 4 to 5 billion users today, and it will grow to some 9 billion users over the course of the next 20 to 30 years. It is the mother of all markets, and only a few visionaries are doing what is necessary to reach out and touch it and grab it and command its future. I spoke last week at Davos about the diplomatic work that the United States is engaged in, that I am engaged in at the direction of President Obama, who believes in this vision and in all of these issues. And our European partners are jointly with us undertaking on three of the most important initiatives right now to make the Middle East and the world more secure. With the help of countries like Germany, the UK, Italy, Denmark, Norway, Russia, we reached an agreement ratified by the United Nations to remove chemical weapons from Syria. Now, obviously, I'm sure there'll be some questions about that, and there ought to be, but together, we need to all keep the pressure on the Assad regime to stop making excuses and fulfill Syria's promises and obligations and meet the UN deadlines. With the help of the EU, Germany, UK, France, and Russia, as well as China, Iran agreed to freeze and roll back its nuclear weapons program for the first time in a decade. And in the coming months, we will remain unified, or I hope we will, to guarantee Iran's willingness to reach a comprehensive agreement that resolves the world's concerns about its nuclear program, hopefully through diplomacy backed up by the potential of force. With the help of the EU and the Quartet, we are pursuing a long-sought and much-needed peace between Israelis and Palestinians. I have to tell you, the alternatives to successfully concluding the conflict, when you stop and list them, are or ought to be unacceptable to anybody. If you look at it hard, you ought to come out and say failure is not an option. Though, regrettably, the dynamics always present the possibility. And so, together, we need to help the parties break through the skepticism, which is half the challenge, and begin to believe in the possibilities that are within their grasp. As President Obama said on Tuesday, in a world of complex threats, our security and leadership depend on all the elements of our power, including strong and principled diplomacy. And it depends on harnessing the power of our strongest alliances, too. No one country can possibly hope to solve any of the challenges that I have listed on its own. That's why this kind of meeting and the alliance that it represents, more importantly, and the work that we do out of here after these meetings 
That's why it's so important that the United States and Europe stick together, that we continue to understand the importance of the strength of our unity and unity in action. Whether we're working on Afghanistan, the Central African Republic, the challenge of the Maghreb, the Levant, the DPRK, global challenges like cybersecurity, infectious disease, or the pursuit of a world without nuclear weapons. Plain and simply, our shared prosperity and security are absolutely indivisible. And in a shrinking world where our fundamental interests are inseparable, a transatlantic renaissance requires that we defend our democratic values and freedoms. Don't for an instant underestimate how important that it is or that the difference that it makes to courageous people like those in the Ukraine, in Ukraine who are standing up today for their ability to have a choice about their future. As I say all of this, the United States is the first to admit that our democracy, too, has always been a work in progress. We know that. We're proud that we work at it openly, transparently, accountably, to reform it, to fix it, and to strengthen it when needed. President Obama's review and revision of our signals intelligence practices is a case in point. So I assure you, we come to this conversation with humility. But humility is not a reason to avoid calling it the way you see it. And the fact is that we see a disturbing trend in too many parts of Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans. The aspirations of citizens are once again being trampled beneath corrupt oligarchic interests, interests that use money to stifle political opposition and dissent, to buy politicians and media outlets, and to weaken judicial independence and the rights of non-governmental organizations. Nowhere is the fight for a democratic European future more important today than in Ukraine. While there are unsavory elements in the streets in any chaotic situation, the vast majority of Ukrainians want to live freely in a safe and a prosperous country. And they are fighting for the right to associate with partners who will help them realize their aspirations. And they have decided that that means their futures do not have to lie with one country alone and certainly not coerced. The United States and the EU stand with the people of Ukraine in that fight. Russia and other countries should not view the European integration of their neighbors as a zero-sum game. In fact, the lessons of the last half century are that we can accomplish much more when the United States, Russia, and Europe work together. But make no mistake, we will continue to speak out when our values and our interests are undercut by any country in the region. President Obama leaves no doubt about America's commitment to this relationship. And he will come to Europe three times already scheduled this year to reinforce the investment in our shared future. For more than 70 years, this year we will celebrate the 70th anniversary of D-Day, the United States and Europe have fought side by side for freedom. And that is what binds us. Those ties have grown stronger in the 25 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, in the 15 years since our post-Cold War NATO enlargements began, in the 10 years since the EU began expanding again. It is important to understand this is more than just a measure of years. It is a measure of the most productive partnership in the history of international affairs, nothing less. Our challenge today is to ensure opportunity, security, and liberty for Americans and Europeans, but also for people all over the world who look to us for that possibility. Our challenge is to renew this partnership and to live up to the legacy of the world's strongest alliance. The 21st century will demand these commitments from all of us, and I believe we have to rise to this occasion 
as Americans and Europeans always have, and that's the only thing that will give meaning to this kind of a meeting and meaning to the legacy that we need to honor in our generation. Thank you.